Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardin.com. Today's program has been brought to you by Route 11 Potato Chips. Made with a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. For more information, visit www.rt11.com. I'm HRN's Communications Director, Kat Johnson, with a preview of the next episode of Meet and 3, our weekly food news roundup. We're fresh off our trip to Slow Food Nations in Denver, a festival that brought together advocates to discuss the future of food. And this week, we're bringing you a special episode inspired by the new Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Manifesto released by Slow Food USA. If we're going to solve food security, we need to say these people have a right to good, healthful food. But we have to do that in a way that kind of insulates this system from the vagaries of the market. Because when you're at a table with somebody, you recognize their humanity. And when somebody cooks for you and serves you food, in a way they're saying they care about your survival. How can we put things into our own hands and have the people of Puerto Rico gain real access to healthy local foods? Listen to Meet and 3 this week for our highlights from Slow Food Nations, available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome to A Hungry Society. I'm Korsha Wilson, and this is a show where we talk about food, food media, and so much more. Today's guest is Adrian Cheatham, chef behind Sunday Best Dinner Series here in New York City. Adrian is a Chicago native and grew up in the kitchens and dining rooms of the restaurants her mother managed. She followed that love of restaurants to jobs all over the country, including Red Rooster in Harlem and Street Bird, and Aldosan Wine Bar in Laberna Dan here in New York. She rose to the ranks to become the executive sous chef, and earlier this year, she was a competitor on Bravo's Top Chef in Colorado. And spoiler alert, <laughs> made it to the finals. <laughs> At this point, it's, it's not a spoiler. Okay. <laughs> it's finished airing. So. I don't know. Maybe, you know, people that haven't caught up yet, but I hope they would catch up by now. I hope so. <laughs> if you're not going to watch it at this point, it's not a spoiler. Right? It's fine. <laughs> well, Adrian, welcome to Hungry Society. Thank you so much for having me, Korsha. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, so as I said, yeah, you were on Top Chef, and I think that was a lot of people's like first introduction to you yeah but it's you've weird. been working in kitchens for over 14 years right yeah right so it's it's so weird but I was pitching investors before going to do Top Chef and one thing that I kept hearing was great resume nice business plan everything looks you know great but we've never heard of you mm. like you've been working for and I was not very active on social media either I mean I was literally in the kitchen with my head down working for like 12 to 16 to 18 to 20 hours a day and it's, you know, it's like a no phone zone. Right. So it's not like you can, you know, snap pictures while you're working. This was, you know, when kitchens, it was like a no-no to pull your phone out during service, even to set a timer. It's like, there's a clock right there. If you need to set a timer, look at the clock. So yeah, it's just, I, people were like, I've never heard of you, which is fine. You know, if you want to be in the background and be behind the scenes, I was great with the operation side of restaurants, 
But if I wanted to do my own thing, I definitely had to introduce myself to people in a way that I hadn't before. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that investors were like, you need a platform, you need (laughs) your follower account has to be up. Like that's wild. And I imagine like post Top Chef, your follower account like exploded. Oh, yeah. It changed like, I mean, exponentially. It Mm -hmm. was such a huge difference because one of the good things I'm glad that I did put in the work for so long, um, you know, I don't regret that. I don't wish that I had done anything differently other than, you know, maybe post food here and there, because I did get to see some really cool stuff along the way. I just never really documented it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do wish I had taken some more pictures, but I'm really happy with the way that I worked hard for a really long time. And Top Chef did give me the opportunity to have to translate that work and help have it kind of pay off a little better. Mm -hmm. So like your storyline on the show was one of my favorites of just how you kind of through trial and error, like found your unique cooking style and um, how you combine different cuisines and ingredients and and memories and, and, and tastes and skills that you picked up in like these fine dining kitchens. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, how do you, see your evolution as a chef like that show or like prior to it or after uh it's it's a very accurate depiction that we saw on top chef it's exactly a microcosm of what i went through deciding on the type of restaurant that i wanted to have the type of menu that i wanted to craft and for years working for other people you know you're you can put a dish on someone's menu and I can put a dish on a menu at someone else's restaurant. If they're the chef, it has to be through their lens. Mm. So I spent most of my career translating food through someone else's vision. And when I finally left restaurants, I took, I was like, I'm just going to take like six months off. I was getting to the point that I was going to get burned out. And I was like, you know, let me just take some time off travel. And when I took that time off, I really could see things much more clearly and was like, okay, I know exactly. I've thought about it for years and I've kind of had these visions and taken notes of dishes and it always came back to components that I grew up with Mm. and things that I was familiar with um, when I would travel to Mississippi to spend summers and spring break with family. And those elements would always come back into the dishes that I was working on. And I couldn't really put them on the menu at La Bernadette. I couldn't really put all of them on the menu at Red Rooster. Um, But it was... You know, I just sat down one night and looked at my notes and I'm like, I've got like six different menus for each season. Mm -hmm. Like, this is incredible. And I started to really see it coming together. And that's exactly what you saw on the show, where at first I'm just kind of like executing dishes that aren't really reflective of me. And then towards the end, I started getting more comfortable with the food that I had seen and thought of and could kind of taste and feel the textures in my mind just hadn't actually started cooking them yet right (laughs) and I think like the the um chefs that you've worked for like stylistically are so so different Mm -hmm. um and you see like so I've I've full disclosure for listeners I've had your food (laughs) (laughs) twice now and it is so so good and so beautiful thank you and it's um you see the combination of like these memories and you know sea urchin and and caviar Mm -hmm. and all these like you know fine dining like you know really crucial elements Mm -hmm. how uh, uh the dish that you served at the juneteenth dinner Yes. Yeah, it was like the uni spoon bread Mm -hmm. with caviar. Can you talk about how that came together? So that is something that I've thought about for a long time. And I've done that dish and tested it out in different iterations. It always had uni, and the component that went with it was always different. So there was always an uni, but before I did it on a sweet potato roasty. Mm -hmm. So it's like a kind of a crispy hash brown with soft center. Um, so I tested it out that way before doing also a toasted miso dashi and I liked it. I really liked the texture contrast with the crispy sweet potato cake and then the uni on top and the dashi. Um, and then I was eating somewhere in LA a few years ago and they had like an uni on scrambled egg and it was like on a little toast. And I'm like, well, scrambled eggs, you know, like when it's done right, it's like kind of custardy and mm-hmm. like small curd and all that. I'm like, well, that softness, that texture reminded me of spoon bread. 
which is more like a souffle version of cornbread. So I'm like, you know what? Instead of putting this on scrambled eggs, why not put the uni on spoon bread? So it just started to evolve and develop along the way. And then it needed a little bit of tartness. So I added the buttermilk to the dashi to give it a little, you know, tart flavor and just kind of add to the complexity of it. And then caviar came into play because why not? I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> Why not throw some caviar in there? Right, you know, once in a while. You know, it it actually did help, though, because it needed a little more uh, brininess. The uni was beautiful, but it was so soft and rich that I was like, I think some caviar would actually make it, like, bring that brininess up. And, yeah, I really liked that one. Yeah, so um, a quick story is, so when I had that dish at the Juneteenth dinner, Mm -hmm. um, your new husband, congratulations, by the way. Newlywed. um, Your husband was saying that he's tried that dish yes <laughs> so many times as you've worked on it at like yeah. various stages he's my guinea pig for right. most things <laughs> and he was saying that early in your relationship you he tried that dish mm-hmm. like you made it for him and he's got he's gotten to see how it's like come together yeah it's and, funny he's seen it from the beginning i was doing a multi-course tasting menu for him one night when we were dating. Oh, when you were dating, you just whipped up. Uh... Yeah, you know, just, <laughs> just, you know, whipped up like a quick eight course. I don't know. Oh, quick eight courses. <laughs> <laughs> and he was traveling back from San Francisco. So he got back in the evening. So I had everything ready. And he was so tired. Poor baby. He, um, <laughs> he fell asleep like maybe five courses in. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like getting the next course ready. And I was like, okay, I'll be right there. And I was like, wait, I don't hear him responding to anything. It's like, I don't expect like a wee chef, but I'm like, right. you know, where is he? So I look around the corner, he dozed off on the couch. I was Aww. like, oh, you will wake up right now. <laughs> yeah, I made, you have three more courses to right. go. Wake up right now. I'm like, now. we can skip dessert, but there is no way in hell that I'm skipping like <laughs> the rest of the savory courses. Awesome. So you're a dinner series that you're doing now post Mm -hmm. post top chef um is is really cool and can you talk about the inspiration for your dinner series yeah it's i kind of fell in love with having a life which i'd never really had before i mean honestly 14 years working in kitchens i've missed family events friends events you know milestones in people's lives i've been at work for so i've missed out on so much and i took the time off was looking to raise money to open a restaurant. My sister had a baby and, you know, you start spending time with your parents again as an adult and you kind of get to know everyone all over again. I can finally spend time with friends. So I wanted to enjoy this period. We were getting engaged. So I wanted to wait until we actually got married and then go back to the plans for opening a restaurant. But I still needed that creative outlet Mm -hmm. and I still wanted to test out the food and the experience that I want diners to have when they eat at the restaurant. It's kind of like, you know, proof of concept. So I had, I needed something. I was like, I I need to cook. I need to feed people. I need to bring people to this experience and just, you know, see what it feels like. Um, So that's how the Sunday Best pop-up series came about because it was easier to do it, you know, once a month at different locations. And then I get to showcase another restaurant in Harlem. And, you know, or or Chris's restaurant in Brooklyn where Mm -hmm. I did one. So it's great to kind of bring people together over like a shared experience like that. Yeah, the the dinner that I went to was at Chris's restaurant, Mm -hmm. your fellow Top Chef competitor. Yes. Um, He has a great restaurant here in Brooklyn called Butterfunk. Mm -hmm. And you both came together and made this like great menu that was so much fun and, and so delicious. Yeah, we had a blast and it was so much fun working with him again because doing the show... You're cooking together, but you're still like playing for your separate teams. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of us working together. I'm in his kitchen in his restaurant, you know, working with his staff and his cooks. And, you know, it was kind of like being in the kitchen, like, you know, with chefs that you're working side by side on the same menu and experience with, Mm -hmm. which we didn't really get to do so much in Top Chef, except for the finale, because Chris was my first pick. So he was on my team for the finale. So, Elephant in the Room, is this leading to your own restaurant, or is that the goal? Yeah, that is the goal. There's actually a project that I want to work on before opening a restaurant. I actually want to open a 
you know, maybe smaller scale food hall in Harlem, Mm. because that's probably the only neighborhood in New York that does not have a food hall yet. Um, So that is something that I'm working on now and, you know, looking for uh, space and trying to, you know, figure out what the cost would be to get that going. Wow, that's amazing. Do you have a, a name in mind? I'm just curious. This isn't. Like. Not yet. I have a couple possible ones, but we have to see with paperwork what's yeah. taken and what's not. Yeah. Well, please keep me posted on definitely. that. Definitely. I mean, Harlem definitely needs. There's so much good food in Harlem. Yeah. There should be a food hall. Yeah. And the restaurant scene is growing tremendously, mm-hmm. but we need something where everybody can come together and get that same kind of communal experience where you're trying different things, but you're eating together still. So I would really love to do that uptown. And like the cost of entry for someone who has an idea for like a a stall or, Mm -hmm. you know, a a quick serve is a lot lower than building out their own space. Yeah. And that's what, you know, we have a lot of restaurants and food vendors up in Harlem that work out of hot bread kitchen and places like that where they have a place to prep and they have a place to, you know, get things ready, but they they don't necessarily have the money to do their own restaurant and to have that outlet to reach customers and interface with them directly. So I think doing a food hall would really help that side of it as well. Kind of like an incubator kind of way to help restaurants, um, you know, just kind of manage those costs to entry. Well, I'm there opening day, so it's, it's I would not even expect a, nothing less. <laughs> right. So we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more a Hungry Society. The following program has been brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington D.C.'s quintessential small hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of forty sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant or enjoy a cocktail and listen to live jazz in one of their cozy Victorian seating areas. Mingle with travelers from around the world who find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit tabardin.com. The following program has been brought to you by Route 11 Potato Chips. From the moment Route 11 Potato Chips dropped their first batch of chips back in the early days of 1992, they understood their destiny as a high-quality producer. Instead of succumbing to the frenzy of mass production, they took advantage of their small size and made chipping a personal art form. The payoff was immediate. An incredible potato chip. With a secret recipe and superior ingredients, their mission is to make an outstanding product in a safe and clean environment. In this world of uncertainty that we live in, Route 11 Potato Chips believes comfort food should be just that. Know where your food comes from. For more information, visit rt11.com. All right, so we're back with Chef Adrian Cheatham, formerly of Red Rooster and La Den and Top Chef <laughs> and all over the place, um, and now doing a dinner series here in New York called Sunday Best. So let's uh, talk a little bit about dining and your relationship with it growing up. Did your family have any traditions growing up? We did have restaurant night at our house, (laughs) which, uh, (laughs) you know, my mom worked in restaurants. So we had a mix of food that she would bring home from work and then food that she would cook. I don't know, maybe five, six nights a week. She would still cook dinner. So we would have, um, you know, a mix where... One or two nights a week, she wanted to clean out the fridge and get rid of leftovers. So we got to kind of order what we wanted, quote unquote. Like, mom is like, you know, here's what we have tonight. And she would like, you know, write it on an easel or chalkboard kind of thing. And it was like spaghetti and meatballs or leftover ribs from the restaurant, you know, all this different stuff. Oh, my God. That sounds so fun (laughs) for a kid. It was. It was a lot. That was actually we got to eat out at home before they were actually comfortable taking us in public because they didn't know how we would (laughs) behave. It was a practice run. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but we had this cool like track lighting over our dinner table. So my mom would turn off the rest of the lights and turn the track lighting on. So it was like being in a dimly lit, cozy restaurant. Oh, that's awesome. It was really cool. That was our first like restaurant experience home. <laughs> and now, I mean, I know you're you're busy cooking, but like, do you go out to eat now? Like yeah. very often? Yeah, my husband and I go out to eat you know, we try to make it out a couple of times a week. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be somewhere close by in the neighborhood in Harlem. Uh, there are so many great restaurants there. 
and you get kind of comfortable being in your neighborhood and not going too far, especially it's so nice. You can walk everywhere. Right. <laughs> but we do try to venture out of the neighborhood mm-hmm. every so often, too. So, Do you have any, like, favorite restaurants at the moment? Like, Ooh, yeah. I went to a sushi restaurant on East 74th a few days ago with my husband, and it was so good. It was, like over the top like every mm. almost every course had like uni and ikura and caviar and just and 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 and, <laughs> and on top of it it started off simple and then the courses got more and more like indulgent as the menu went on um but it was so damn good oh my god so good what's the name of it uh it was sushi ishikawa ishikawa yeah I'm pretty sure that was the name. It's on, I know it's on East 74th, like right around First Avenue. Mm -hmm. So pretty far east, but beautiful place. Is there a restaurant that you go to more often than others? Yeah. That you're a regular at? Yeah, there are a couple. Up in Harlem, uh, we do go to a restaurant called Clay a fair amount. We go to Mountain Bird um, a lot there also. And, oh, Vinatoria in Harlem. That's actually where we met, my husband and I. So we go there. They have a great wine selection and really friendly staff. And they just got a new chef this past year who's uh, from Baltimore. And um, her name is Mimi. And, you know, it's just such a fun group of people there. So, and we've been going for such a long time that, you know, we know a lot of the staff there now. So mm-hmm. we do go there a fair amount. Wow. At a Venturia? Venturia. Venturia. Yeah. Okay. Have to check that out. Yeah, it's And really Clay, good. I've heard amazing things about. Yeah. Yeah. The food is really good. I actually did the last pop-up there at the at their restaurant. Nice. Yeah. So speaking of the pop-up, uh, what's coming up next? Like, what? Uh, what? where can listeners, like, learn more information and follow? So I always post it on Instagram, which is Chef Adrian Cheatham. And then I also have the website, which is adriancheatham.com. And... So far, I've been doing large dinners at restaurants where we're seating anywhere between 60 and 90 people. Um, And that's been a blast. It's a lot of fun. But for that, we can only do four courses. So I'm looking, there are some smaller locations in Harlem, like more of a chef's counter kind of style where I'm seating maybe at the most 20 people. Because I feel like for that, just me and, um, and like my you know, staff or, you know, the one person that works with me. It's not like I have a staff or a (laughs) pop-up. But I do have a a cook that works with me named Lindsay. So for that, I would love to do maybe 20 people because then we could do seven or eight courses. Mm -hmm. So that's the next iteration of Sunday Best is scaling it down in terms of size, but scaling up the menu size. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, while the pop-up is still going on, working on the food hall plan. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you have any um, young chefs that follow your career and your work that ask for advice. I do have a few that have reached out. And I'm always really, really responsive because I've benefited from people that um, even like five minutes of someone's time helped me solve a huge issue that helped shape my career. So I would never want to be that asshole that's like... (laughs) oh, I'm too busy to like right. answer an email or something like that. Like, no, if people reach out, like I'm responding. And there were a couple of people that reached out on Instagram. Um, one young lady just wanted to get some experience before going to culinary school. So now she works with me for every pop-up. Oh, wow. She'll prep with me for a couple of days ahead and then help with service during. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a guy from Chicago who I'd actually gone to high school with who was out here in culinary school, who hit me up and just said the same thing, like wanted to get some experience. So he came and worked with me at the pop-up at Red Rooster. And it was so cool. You know, it's like great because I get to show someone what I've learned along the way. Mm -hmm. And then answering like little questions along the way, like where should I intern? Where, you know, I'm always happy to, you know, refer someone or give them a contact number or email if I haven't worked with them, it's hard for me to say, right. like, I'm vouching for you because we haven't worked together. But, you know, nowadays showing a little bit of effort is something that's actually more and more rare. Mm. You would see a lot of people kind of knocking on doors before. But now, I, you know, it just seems, I don't know, like people are more like, 
you know, if I get here or here, like they have 12 choices, it's not like three choices and you're just like going hard to try to get one of those three. It's like, I have 12 choices, whichever one comes through, I'll be good. Do you, do you recommend that chefs narrow it down a bit to, to well, how would you recommend narrowing down like which restaurants to intern at or be interested in or? It's, you know, you should start with a style that you want to learn or something that you want to learn. Is it more modern is are you going for someone that has like cutting edge plating and techniques that they're using that are just you know kind of out there or do you want to learn excuse me from like a steady kind of you know upscale place that offers solid techniques solid training um amazing consistency in food or do you want to go more casual so kind of pick a style first of something that you really want to learn to form your kind of basis and then go on from there. What would you tell your younger chef self? What would you, <laughs> what, would you what would you say to young chef Adrian? Oh, Jesus. I would just say like don't play scared, you know. Scared money don't make money. It's you either have to go for it or get the fuck out. You know, it's, you don't, you know, there's no room for hesitation and uncertainty. And that's half of what being in a kitchen is not necessarily cooking, but being in a kitchen and the dynamic of people is whoever is more like certain Mm -hmm. about the way something should be usually wins the argument. They could be dead wrong, but that's, who's going to win the argument. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't, don't, Discount your information and what you know to be right because someone else seems more certain. Yeah, I have so much respect for um, line cooks in general and and chefs in general because I, when I was a line cook, I was terrible at it because of that scared thing. Like I would constantly second guess, yeah. so like you know, should I be plating it this way? Should I be? Oh, that pan's a little too hot. Mm-hmm. Like should I turn that down? But then this other, the garlic in here is burning. Right, like it. it I understand completely what you're saying. And I think especially in like back of the house, it is so like that confidence of this is the right move Mm -hmm. makes a difference between doing a good job and not. Yeah. There's no time for second guessing because that means you're not completely focused on the next task because you're still like thinking about it and wondering if you're doing the right thing. So it kind of clouds everything else that you're doing. Front of the house was way better for me. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a talent I do not possess. <laughs> right. Yeah, there is like a line. I've met very few people who are good at both. You either one side makes yeah. sense or the other side makes sense. <laughs> so I have a couple questions I ask every guest that comes on the show. Um, can you talk about one of your worst dining experiences? You don't have to name the restaurant. Okay. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Nah, I don't think I will. But it was, um, it was not that long ago, maybe a year, year and a half ago. And the food was good. It was like a solid place, good food. Um, you know, it was like the, the owners own a few, a few restaurants in New York and I've been to almost all of them. And this one was a newer one on the Upper West Side near Central Park. And I went there with my, well, at the time, Stephen and I were still dating And his mom was in town and we went to dinner at this place and we each got an appetizer. We each got an entree. We each, I think, got a separate dessert, if not two that the three of us shared, got wine, you know, a cocktail and a glass of wine each. As soon as the waiter, you know, collected the dessert plates, we still had a little wine and we're finishing up our drinks. No lie, within 30 seconds of the waiter clearing the table, I saw her over at the, you know, the stand, the service station, and a guy with a jacket on, assuming manager, was talking to her and kind of pointed back at our table. And she looked at him and was like, no. And I was like, okay. Something weird's happening. (laughs) Right. Like something's going on. And she was like, no. And, you know, turns out he wanted her to drop the check. And she's like, I literally just cleared, you know, it looked like she was saying like, no, I'm not doing that right now. Like I just cleared their plates. So he turns around prints the check, brings it to our table within a minute, minute and a half of clearing dessert plates. While we still have wine, we're still talking, we're in the middle of like a great conversation and that just really, and he's like, sorry to interrupt you guys, but we need the table back and I can't, you know, here's in like He said we need the table back? He did. And I'm like, well, it's, 
about nine o'clock. How many more tables are you seating? And it was a big restaurant. It's like I passed empty tables and I see empty tables around us. It's not like we were at like a coveted table in a certain part of the restaurant. We were kind of like in a weird space, like right by the service station and like tossed some drink chips on the table and was like, we have a bar up front. If you guys want to grab a couple drinks, you can go there. Wow. I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, we will just be leaving. Thank you. Right. Like, uh, I was, I was, it was, yeah. Just kill the, like. Everything. Yeah. Like, conversation stopped. Joy and having fun experience at this restaurant stopped. It was just like, great. Thanks. And Thanks, the, buddy. And you said the food was good. That's yeah. so sad. Yeah. But, you know, something like that makes you not want to return because right. it really overshadows everything. And that's why front of the house is such an important part of a restaurant because no matter how good the food is if you have a bad experience in the front of the house you're not going to want to return right and vice versa if the food is awful you can have amazing service that might get you back in the door to give the kitchen you know and the food another shot but bad service can make or break you know a restaurant just as much as the food and the the drink chips that's just oh. like that was like add insult to injury. Right. Like, like, that's not what we care about right now. Right. <laughs> like, we're just enjoying each other's company and, like, just abrupt end to hospitality. Yeah. Here's yeah. your check. Go. Yeah. So much so that when the when he was doing that, I looked over and saw the waiter at the service station. She was just, like, shaking her head at the service station, like, I can't believe he's doing this. Mm. And she just walked away. Wow. I was like, great. So it's not just me who's, who feels like this is crazy right now. Right. <laughs> so you're like, I'm not alone. Right. And I don't this go to restaurants crazy. like I work in the industry. So it's not like he knew that I work in the hospitality industry. But as a paying guest, that's just not something you do. Right. Right. Crazy. So beyond uh, the sushi experience that you just recently had, can you remember a really memorable dining experience? Mm. Yes. My husband and I were at, huh, funny, we were at La Bernadette, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be biased, but I kind of am. Um, and he's traveled a lot for work, like literally all over the world. And he had never been to La Bernadette. So we went for my birthday maybe two years ago. And at the end of the meal, he was like, this was the best dining experience I have ever had. Like beginning to end staff is attentive but not intrusive um you know just he was like the little details and the little touches and not to mention how amazing the food was but the wine pairings were great the service side was great and even though I knew the staff it's not like you know they were stopping to talk to us the whole time but you know it was just it was like perfect everything was always perfect and I remember having that same experience you know eating there before I worked there mm. So it's not like it was special service for me, um, maybe a little more familiar than anything else, but it was amazing. And that must have felt really good for him to be like, you know, you're bringing this person into a place that means so much yes. to you. And, and to see how much he enjoyed it was like amazing because I could, you know, you can tell when somebody's happy or not with things. And he was so happy. I mean, he was like on a cloud for like the next day or two just off of the dining experience there. Wow. That's wonderful. Uh, so, Adrian, if you could have your last meal in a restaurant, where would it be and who is invited? Hmm. That is a tough call. Jeez, Corsi, you really ask the hard questions I here. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like to end with the hard questions. Right. Oh, man. It would probably be something family style, um, like really good Korean barbecue Shabu shabu, like something like that, that has like strong, assertive flavors. Um, and it would be, I mean, obviously my mother, my husband, my sister and her husband, because it's always going to be a great conversation. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of friends, too. Yeah, definitely. But it would mainly be like, you know, like close friends that are essentially family. Um, and it would be something communal that we're all like sharing and talking kind of like we're at home. A couple bottles drinking? of wine, too. Yeah, I was going to ask, what are you drinking? <laughs> well, we would probably start with champagne before dinner, wine during, or beer, and then a bourbon at the end. Okay, any particular bourbon? I am a fan of Revival. Okay. I'm a big fan of Revival. If I'm going bourbon, if I want rye, then it's probably going to be like Rittenhouse, you know, something like that. Um, 
and my husband's more of a scotchy scotcherton so <laughs> <laughs> um and where is this this restaurant is it here in new york is it in chicago is it in mississippi is it mm. somewhere you traveled this is i would all i would want it to be in hypothetically in chicago back home mm. definitely yeah because that's you know that just feels like home like new york now feels like home but there's something about going to the city that you're actually from where you know that once you walk out these doors it's not just you in this city you have family you have friends you can you know crash at somebody's place if <laughs> your plans go to crap and you know it's just it can be a totally different feeling in a city where you know you're from versus a city that you live in wonderful well Adrian, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It was a blast to have you on the show. Yes, this was a lot of fun. And listeners can check out AdrianCheatham.com uh, and your Instagram. Uh, Chef Adrian Cheatham. And Twitter, Facebook. Twitter is AC's Kitchen and Facebook is Adrian Cheatham. Excellent. Well, listeners, definitely check that out. You want, trust me, you want to go and check out this dinner series. It's amazing are there any plans to ever do it in another city yeah i'm actually looking at doing it in chicago uh towards the end of september and potentially la and birmingham wow amazing awesome well thank you so much for coming thank you for having me this has been a great time (laughs) and thank you so much for listening we'll catch you next week on the hungry society Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network, wherever you listen to podcasts.